We're so glad you joined us today at Liberty. Go ahead, Sam. We're going to worship him together. seated for just a few moments. Uh, once again, we'd like to welcome you this morning to Liberty. We are so excited, so thrilled that you chose to be here worshiping with us today. 
Uh, really quickly before we get started, uh, we have a fantastic morning plan for you guys. We have DJ Shockley in the house today. He's going to be sharing a little bit of his story, so you get to hear from him a little bit later. I'm telling you, it's going to be a, a great time together. Uh, but before we do that, if this is your first time visiting or you've been coming for a little while and you haven't really connected with us yet, they're going to put a phone number on the screen. Uh, if you're in person or online, if you'll simply just text the word info to that phone number, uh, it'll make sure that we have your contact information so we can keep you up to date on everything that's happening happening here at Liberty. Uh, we have a pretty jam-packed summer that you don't want to miss out on. Uh, you can also download the Liberty Church app, and I'm telling you, that is such a great way to get connected. You can find all kinds of information, uh, past message series, uh, ways to get involved in volunteering, small groups, uh, information about upcoming events and how to sign up for them. So make sure you do one of those two things for us. If you can't do either one of those, there's also a welcome card in the seat pocket in front of you. You can simply fill it out with your information, leave it in the seat as you leave, and one of our worship hosts will come and collect it at the end of the service. Uh, but uh, as we continue, uh, they're going to put uh, different ways you can give. Just a reminder, we won't be taking a physical offering, but we've tried to make it as easy as possible. So there's different ways that you can give here at Liberty. Uh, if you are in person, uh, you could also give through one of the generosity boxes in the commons area as you leave. Uh, really quick before I pray. I just want to remind you guys, uh, we have a lot of stuff going on this summer, but one thing that I want to uh, tell you guys about is our annual Back to School Bash, which will be happening August 1st. I'm telling you, uh, I don't think there's a better outreach ministry uh, for our church than the Back to School Bash. Uh, man, it really is a tangible way for us to get into our community and just to show them how much we love them. If you're not familiar with it, it's basically a school supply drive. We like to give out backpacks filled with school supplies to school-age children in our area, as well as offering them free haircuts uh, for the fall school term. And uh, it takes a lot of people to kind of pull it off. And so if you are interested in be, uh, being a part of Back School Bash, uh, you can go on our app, any of our social media accounts, and you can find out how you can be involved. Uh, I'm telling you, it is an extremely rewarding experience that you don't want to miss out on. If you can't physically help with the event, you can also help make it possible uh, by donating to it. Any donation goes directly towards that event. You can also find that information online, or you can even go to our bookstore this morning, and they can help you uh, in uh, donating to that event. So on um, that, let's go ahead. We're going to bow for a word of prayer, and then we'll continue worship this morning. Dear Jesus, we're so grateful for who you are. Lord, we're so thankful, Lord, that you love us, God. And Lord, we're just so thankful, Lord, for your faithfulness this morning, God, that we can just come into this place and just have this time just to brag on you and, Lord, just to worship you. And we ask as we just continue on today that you would just move and work in this place, God, that you would just reveal to us your presence, Lord. Lord, that you would just open up our hearts this time of worship and to later on to the speaking, God. And we just are in awe of who you are. Lord, just, again, just move and work in this place as only you can. It's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand as we continue in worship today?
I love this next song I'm about to sing because it's such a great reminder of our God's faithfulness. Yeah, I think uh, when we're facing difficult circumstances or, or trying times, I, I think the most difficult thing in that is just the waiting of it. Not knowing which way it's going to go, if it's going to go our way or if something else is going to happen. But I'm so grateful that we serve a God who is faithful and that we don't have to worry about things like that because he is in control. If we just give all of our circumstances, all of our issues to him, he will see us through. And I'm so grateful that we can have this time just to celebrate who he is, to celebrate his faithfulness. As we just sing this song, let's just make it our prayer that we are not enough unless he intervenes in our behalf. So come on, let's just celebrate his faithfulness today. We're going to sing this out together. I can't go back to the beginning. I can't control what tomorrow will bring. But I know. the place where you promised to be. Come on, we sing it out. I'm not enough. I'm not enough unless you come. Will you meet me here again? It's all I want. Cause all I want so you are will you meet me here again and as I walk now through the valley Let your love rise above every fear Like the sun shaping the shadow In my weakness your glory appears Come on, we sing it out, I'm not enough
words one more time together. Let's sing it out. Sing them not enough. I'm not enough unless you come. Will you meet me here again? So no one. So. God, this morning as we come before you, we just bow before your holiness. God, we ask that you would meet us here, that you would make a way for us. We ask that you would just draw us to worship you, that you would teach us about you, and that you would send us out of this place, God, with your fire and with your light so that we can take it to the world. We ask for our, our volunteers and all of our workers this morning just to be able to set everything aside and worship you and shine your light to our our kids and to our youth, God, and we, we thank you and we ask all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we got a special treat this morning. Why don't you guys help me really quick and welcome to the stage, Mr. DJ Shockley. <laughs> and DJ, we are so thrilled, so honored to have you here this morning uh, at Liberty Church. I know uh, a lot of people are excited. You know, uh, yeah, careful of that. <laughs> that was almost ugly. <laughs> um, you know, you've had a, a great career. You know, you quarterback for the University of Georgia, drafted the NFL by the Atlanta Falcons, and now, you know, still involved in sports, just kind of on, on the other side as an analyst for ESPN. And, you know, I know a lot of people were here, uh, thrilled to hear that you were going to be here, thrilled to hear your story a little bit this morning. And, uh, you know, being this close to Athens, I am confident that we have some Georgia fans in the house. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that's, uh, that's good to hear because I, I wanted to check the room because I know a few weeks back you guys had a couple of Auburn guys in here, so I wanted to make sure, you know. See, a couple of Auburn people, see, you know. They're kicking them out. There we go. We are. Goodness. At least we didn't do that while they were here, and I appreciate that. <laughs> but, no, we are so thrilled to have you here. And, uh, you know, before we're going to obviously talk a little bit about football, before we really dive in, uh, you know, as being a former Georgia player, an analyst now, what's your thoughts on Georgia this season? You know what, I think the dog's going to be pretty good, I, I'll be honest. Uh, I've had a chance to talk to Kirby, I've had a chance to be down there, um, and the talent that they have coming back, I think is tremendous, especially on both sides of the ball. Uh, you get a second year in this offense on the Todd Monk and the offensive coordinator. JT played really well in the latter part of that season. Um, all the running backs are back. Kirby and that staff has recruited really well, uh, and it sets up pretty well. Uh, obviously, it starts with their first game, down in Charlotte uh, to go beat up on Dabo, that'll be good. But uh, we'll, we'll see what happens there. But I think Georgia is set up to be really good, and I expect them to be there at the end. Well, you to, heard it here first as a former player and an analyst. He thinks they're going to do good. So maybe there's hope for you Georgia fans this morning. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, you know, obviously you had a great career, Georgia. You know, uh, played quarterback. Uh, but 2005 was an especially good year. You know, Georgia won the 2005 SEC championship. Not only that, but you were named MVP for that game. Can you talk to us a little bit what that experience was like, what it meant to you? Yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. It was gratifying. It was gratifying and satisfying all in one for a couple different reasons. Uh, obviously, coming into that year, a lot of people thought Georgia would finish third in the SEC East, and they say Georgia would finish third because of the guy playing quarterback, which was me. And uh, obviously, that was a lot for me at the time to, to kind of uh, comprehend and deal with, but to be able to go through that season and win it in the fashion that we did was pretty cool because, like I mentioned, nobody expected us to be there. 
We had just lost David Green. We lost Pollock. We lost Thomas Dave. We lost all these All-Americans. And you had a bunch of guys like myself who was kind of backed up for the last three, four years and had a chance to kind of step to the forefront and to have our opportunity and to be able to capitalize on it. And win an SEC championship was pretty cool. And uh, one of those feelings I'll never forget. You know, as you know, you were a pretty young man when you were playing quarterback. You know, did you feel pressure, especially in that season when you got close to that championship game? I did. Uh, there was a lot of things that uh, I would say uh, that made me a little uh, bit anxious, I should say. Uh, like I mentioned, coming into that season, everybody thought that we finished third because of me. And going into that season, I knew there was a lot on me because people expected a lot from me. And lucky enough for me, I had a lot of good guys around me, a lot of great teammates. Uh, but going into that season, uh, I had to kind of self-evaluate myself. Um, there were a lot of things that happened in that 05 season before the season even started that helped me become who I am today. And uh, just taking on that leadership role in that team and then being one of those guys who had to step up and be a leader of that team was, was pretty cool. And uh, it was paramount for us all, and we ended up doing some really good things. Yeah, um, you know, you were often considered as uh, Mark Rick's first major recruit uh, when he became head coach for Georgia. What was it like? You know, I mean, we had him here actually a, a little over a year ago, and um, you know, he seemed like a fantastic guy. And um, what was it like? You know, playing for him. You know, I tell you, the number one thing about Coach Rick is what you see on TV, or if you ever meet him, that's who he is. He is genuinely the most genuine guy you ever meet or come across. And he is a guy who, obviously my parents had a lot to do with who I am today, but he was a big part of the man that you see in front of you. And I'll tell you guys a quick story. Uh, there was a time when I was thinking about leaving the University of Georgia. And I went to his office and he knew I was thinking about leaving. I came in, he sat down. And in this moment is when I knew exactly who Coach Rick was. I knew who he was, but in this moment, I knew exactly who he was, and he was the guy I wanted to play for. When I came in and sat down, he said, Shock, look, I know you're thinking about transferring. I know there's a lot of people pulling on you, but a couple things I will tell you that I know is true. One is I love you. Two is I can't tell you you're going to start X amount of games. I can't tell you I can give you X amount of plays, but all I know is you'll leave University of Georgia with a smile on your face. And in that moment, I knew this was a guy who cared about me as a man more than just a player. And I didn't know what that would be like if I went anywhere else. But I knew in Coach Rick what I had. And the interesting part about it was after we won that game uh, in 2005, in the SC Championship game, there was a picture of me and him standing on the, on the stage. And I got my arm around him, and I got a huge smile on my face. And his caption was, I told you you would leave here with a smile on your face. <laughs> So it was uh, pretty cool. But ultimately, I think that part of it and seeing how he was in his faith every single day in a job where it is really hectic to be that guy all the time showed me exactly what a man of God looks like every single day. And I wanted to emulate that. That's, that's awesome. You know, we're big on legacy here. We like to talk about leaving a lasting legacy. And you know, we had Mark here, and, you know, he obviously talked a lot about the impact that Bobby Bowden made on him. And now hearing from you the impact that Mark made on you, it's such a cool thing to kind of see how it all kind of comes together. And it's pretty ironic that you mentioned that because in my last year, they had this award that just came out, and it was called the Bobby Bowden FCA Award. And basically it was about, you know, what you did in the community, how you carried yourself, uh, on and off the field, and to have Coach Bowden on one side, Coach Rick on the other side, being his first recruit to get that award, and everything that he learned from Coach Bowden, and you could just see it, you know, lineage going along, you could just tell the impact that both those guys have made, and then the impact they made on me was pretty cool. That's awesome. That's really incredible. You know, um, obviously you have that SEC championship, you name MVP, but outside of that, throughout your career, you know, what, what would you say is one of the most memorable moments that you've had? There are a lot of, I think, memorable moments throughout my career, uh, especially on the field that I could talk about. But I think the number one most memorable thing that I think about that ultimately helped me do what I did on the field was something that happened off the field. Our team chaplain, his name was Kevin Hines, at the beginning of that year in 2005, when I felt like everything was on my shoulders, he said, hey, I want you to come to my office. 
let's sit down, let's talk. And he started talking. He said, hey, man, you're the leader of this team. These guys will follow you anywhere. And I want you to start doing a couple different little things. And we started a Bible study. I started in my apartment, and we, you know, had started out with four or five guys. By the end of the year, we had, you know, 30, 40 guys in a small apartment, uh, you know, talking about God and how good he is. Uh, but ultimately, the one thing that really sticks out of my mind is he gave me one scripture to read. And it was John 3.30, which was, he must increase and I must decrease. And in that moment, when I read it, I went home and I came back and I was like, I read it, but I don't really get it. He said, I want you to dive into it a little bit more and really think about it. And it finally hit me. And I came back and I understood it. And in that moment, I realized I had to give everything I had to God. Because at the end of the day, I tried to put everything on my shoulder. We try to do that in life. We try to put everything on our shoulder and carry all the weight. But at the end of the day, God will carry it for you. And that stress that was taken off me by God helped me become the player that I was. And I was able to just relax and be the player and the guy and the person that God made me to be. So that one little scripture propelled me to where I was and who I am. And that's kind of the most memorable thing for me. Obviously, the, the stuff on the field w was cool, but I think without that moment and without understanding that I didn't have to do it all myself was ultimately the reason why I was able to be successful. Yeah, that is a powerful word, yeah. And we'll just pray right there and end the service. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, now, uh, you know, you mentioned the, the FCA award, which I, I think is really cool. You know, and I heard you were coming. I was kind of brushing up on your stats a little bit, and I saw that you won that. And it's kind of a unique award because, as you mentioned, it's, it's awarded to a D1 player who just exemplifies faith in the community, in the classroom, on the field. And to me, what's so cool about that kind of award, uh, you know, that's not you so much professing your faith. It's others seeing your faith lived through your life, which I think is so, so cool. Um, you know, you know, for you, tell us what characteristics um, of life really mattered to you as a college student that people would notice your faith just lived out through your life. Like, what what mattered to you that people would notice so much? I think the number one, there are a couple of things. I think one is the character of the person that you are, and then the first impressions. Um, I tell my kids, I tell uh, people I meet all the time. Uh, I know people will forget the touchdowns. They will forget the games you play. They'll forget some of the stuff you do on the field. But I don't want people to ever forget the person. I don't ever want people to forget if you met me in a grocery store or you see me on TV and you hear me talking that you say, okay, that guy is a great guy. Or you meet him in the grocery store and he speaks and he's hello, he's how you doing, he, he's mannerable. Those are the things that matter to me because at the end of the day, those first impressions are everything and you can't get those back. And I always wanted people to know when you met DJ Shockley, that is a guy, for one, that loves God, but he is a mannerable guy. He is a guy of high character, and you know exactly who he is at all times. And that mattered to me most than any touchdown or anything you ever saw me do on the field, because ultimately that stuff will go away. But the man, the person, who you are, that's what matters. Yeah, that's fantastic. One thing that's said a lot from this uh, stage, this, from this platform is, Christians don't have the luxury of being unkind, you know, no matter what. And I think that's something that we need to strive to live for every single day, for sure. Um, you know, you speak a lot. And, um, you know, when you do, um, there's three things that you talk, you know, that, that you say that you love more than anything. It's football, family, and faith. And obviously, we're going to talk more about faith in just a few moments. Um, one thing, you know... Uh, that's important to us here at, at our church is really uh, investing in the next generation. The next generation is so important to us. So what's some things that are important to you, uh, even that you'd want to sh you know, share with your own children, um, but that you really want to share with the next generation? I think just being a man that they love and respect, especially for my kids. I have an 11-year-old daughter who's over here right now. She rolled down with me. Uh, she's over there. She's a, a gymnast. She's very shy. She probably won't look up or say anything, but uh, uh, she's finally getting over being mad at me. Uh, we, we, we came in this morning from Buford, so we had to get up probably about 5.15, and she was not happy about it. She is not a morning person. Uh, but ultimately, I think it's how you carry yourself in every situation. Um, for my kids, I want them to see how I treat their mom, you know, how I talk to their mom, 
how I go about my business every single day. Uh, Dad is a guy who goes out and he provides. He prays with us. Uh, that's one thing that's important to me is we try to pray every night as a family together so that they know that God is important and they understand. And the thing I love to do is I give them a chance to, to pray themselves. Like we all, it's four of us. I've been with my wife since high school, so she knows me. We just celebrated our 12-year anniversary uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, thank you. Um, I have, a, I have a nine-year-old son, um, so uh, dads, we know how impressionable our little guys can be, so I want to make sure that uh, he understands what it, what it means to be a man and the man of the household, and that's important to me. But them seeing me uh, do what I'm supposed to do and also saying what I'm supposed to is most important. You can say everything in the world, but I want them to see it. I want them to see me making the actionable efforts to show that, hey, I'm a guy that they will always be able to depend on regardless of any situation. And uh, one thing that I always, you know, kind of kind of tell them um, and it's, it's, it's one of those things that I want them to grow up to be great young men and women and I want them to know that God loves them and I love them, their mom loves them, but at the end of the day, carry yourself the right way at all times. Yeah. That is unbelievable, yeah. That's so important. Uh, you know, uh, I, we kind of talked a little bit about, you know, love languages earlier this morning, me you and our student pastor. And, uh, you know, it's really cool. Uh, I love the relationship between kids and parents um, because, you know, when a child is born, I feel like their love for their parents is automatic. Yeah. You know, it's like you're the first ones they see when they open their eyes. You're the ones caring for them. You're the ones taking care for them. So you don't really have to try that hard for your children to love you, at least in the beginning, <laughs> at least in the beginning. <laughs> so I feel like, especially in the early stages of life, it's really just up to the parents not to mess it up, you yeah, know, because the kids, yeah. it's just automatic love. I might have messed that up with getting her up at 5.15, <laughs> so I don't know. The love is still there. It's just changed yeah, a little bit. It's just yeah. changed a little bit. But, but, but that's the other part, too, is I wanted her to see me in this environment as well. Yeah. She has seen dad on a football field. She's seen videos, but I wanted her to see me be able to speak about the love I have for them, the love I have for God, and not just me hear, it, hear her see it, but she can actually see me talk about it and be about it. So that's why I thought it was important for her to be here, even if it was early in the morning. At the end of the day, I'm sure she still loves you, at least a little bit, <laughs> as long as she gets that nap on the ride home. No doubt. <laughs> uh, you know, you... Um, you said you were with your wife since high school. Um, you know, obviously you weren't married that whole time, but what was it like, you know, I know you didn't have like a, a big family throughout your whole career, but what was it like, you know, balancing career with relationship and how was that dynamic? You know, was, was, was it difficult? You might want to ask my wife about that. She, was, you know, she may have a totally different answer than me. But, uh, you know, uh, obviously I, I wasn't perfect. Uh, not gonna sit here and say I was perfect. Uh, obviously we went through all different stuff throughout our time, but I think, the stuff we went through helped us get to the point where we are now. And that's one thing I always say, God puts us in different positions and situations for, for the right season. And the fact that, you know, we're still here after being together since high school uh, speaks volumes and God knew what I needed. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> that's all you can ask for right there. <laughs> um, so with what you do, you know, working in the sports industry, it's definitely more of a secular industry. I think it's safe to, to assume and say that. Um, you know, and I, I think most of us can see that there tends to be a little bit of tension between the secular culture and Christianity. And, uh, you know, for me personally, I, I'm in full-time ministry, so I might not be as exposed to it as some people are, but I know a lot of people here this morning, they work normal jobs, secular industries. You know, for you, what was that like? You know, how did you balance your personal faith in a very secular industry and was, was that difficult for you to navigate and kind of balance? But I'll be honest, it, it really wasn't because I knew who I was. Um, I knew what God had done for me. And regardless of whatever job or situation I was in, people knew that DJ Shockley loved God. He knew, they knew that I wasn't going to change for whoever it was. And if the people I was around didn't like it, that's on you. Yeah. I'm going to continue to be who I am. I'm not going to change for the situation I'm in or the job I'm in or whoever I'm around, that's not who I am. I'm always going to be genuine to who I am because at the end of the day, people can see through the fakeness. At the end of the day, you got to be who you are and by yourself. 
you know, in, in your younger years coming out of high school and, and, you know, straight into college football, did you feel a lot of peer pressure from anybody, uh, you know, about your faith or, or anything like that? You know, I, it, you did, but then also I had parents who were, I think, obviously they were smart, but they were smart enough to, to I understood, you need to be around the right people. Yeah. I think sometimes we get into the wrong groups, we get into the wrong, around the wrong people that are doing things that we know aren't right. And at an early age, I knew if I wanted to be at a certain place, this group probably wasn't for me. Yeah. And you have to be strong enough to understand and strong enough to be able to say, that's not the group I need to be in if I want to be in the place that I want to go. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, that's what I had to do was, where do you want to go? Yeah. And if you want to, you know, still be doing the same old things, you save that group. But if you want to be better, you want to show people what you're about, you got to step out a little bit and maybe, maybe a little lonely, but at the end of the day, you won't regret your decision. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, when I, you know, I was younger, a pastor who invested in my life a lot uh, always said this. I think he said it every other time he was on the platform. He said, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Mm -hmm. And that just stuck with me all throughout mm -hmm. the years. Um, uh, you know, navigating that, you know, kind of balancing that. Do you ever feel like because, you know, you're pretty strong, you know, professing your faith and, you know, you, obviously you, you don't shy away from, from who you are. Do you ever feel like there was an extra spotlight on you because of that? Like people were kind of looking for you to mess up mm. uh, and kind of looking for you to stumble. But I'll be honest, I, I, didn't, I didn't mind the spotlight. I mean, I didn't mind people seeing who I am because I wasn't going to change regardless. Uh, I didn't mind people seeing that I love to talk about God. I didn't mind people seeing that didn't matter where I was at, I still was going to be that same guy, that same person. I wasn't going to change for whoever I'm around. So the more eyes that saw it, maybe that one or two people who saw it and maybe say, hey, I want to be more like that and help them bring them over a little bit, then that's fine with me. So I didn't mind the spotlight. I enjoyed it. Uh, but at the end of the day, I was gonna, always going to be who I am. And if you didn't like it, guess what? We probably weren't going to be friends. <laughs> that's a great outlook to have. <laughs> um, you know, you know, we mean you talked uh, a little bit on Friday, and uh, you, you said you know a lot of your story has to do with overcoming obstacles. And you know, he, here you are, you're, you know, living a great witness. Uh, you win an awards for just, you know, being an outstanding, you know, witness for your faith with the FCA award. You're, it seems like you're doing all the right things, yet you're still hitting a lot of obstacles. Mm. In your life, you know, can you kind of tell us about some of those obstacles and kind of how you overcame those obstacles? Yeah, I mean, obviously a lot of it had to do with sports because that's the, the realm I was in. Uh, but I believe sports has helped me get to the point where I am today. Uh, just for a couple examples, when I got to the University of Georgia, I was the number two rated quarterback in the country. So thinking I'm going to come there and play and take over and be the guy was what I thought. But didn't end up playing until my fifth year. But going into my freshman year, I had a chance to start. Me and my, my buddy, good friend of mine, we still talk to this day, David Green. Uh, kids play together, all that kind of stuff. We were competing for the job, playing against Tennessee. I run out of bounds. They, got, they had the grass on the field and turf on the sideline. My foot hits where the grass and turf meets, and I break my fifth metatarsal, which is your pinky toe. So I'm out six weeks. David takes off. He's the guy. Now I get my chance in 05 to be the guy. And I told you, everybody thought we were going to be bad. Everybody thought we were going to be third in the East, whatever it is. But here we are, middle of the year. We're 6-0. and Everybody's patting us on the back. Everybody's saying how good we are. Sixth game of the year, we're playing Arkansas. I step up in the pocket about to throw. One guy hits me high. One guy hits me high. One guy hits me low. I think my knee's messed up. I got a little meniscus tear. I'm out for two or three weeks. I remember, I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to do. And I'm like, why is this happening right now? This is my moment. This is my time to shine. Why is this happening? End up coming back. We end up winning the SEC championship. Everything worked out great. Get to the National Football League, drafted in the seventh round, uh, 2007. Michael Vick is gone. Matt Schaub has gone, left the Houston Texans. I'm competing with Joey Harrington and uh, Chris Redman for the starting job, playing really great. I mean, everybody thinks I'm going to be the guy, starting in the National Football League for the Atlanta Falcons. Second preseason game, playing really good, taking, taking the team up and down the field, uh, we're on about the 15-yard line. I drop back to throw, and I take off. And it's me and this one guy on like the two, three-yard line. I go to cut left. My knee goes right. I tear my ACL. Multiple opportunities here where college, I think I had opportunity. My last year at 05, 
I'm thinking, this is the year. Nothing can go wrong. Hurt my knee. International Football League. Got a chance to be the starter in the pinnacle of what is my career as a National Football League and start and get hurt. Now I go into the broadcast world. Everybody wants to do broadcasting. Everybody, any, any athlete comes straight out, you play 10, 15 years in the league, they throw them right up, you feel like you're better than that guy. But I think at the end of the day, all those things that happen prepared me for who I am today. Because God knew at that moment in those times, I needed to go through those things to get to where I am today. I love this saying, you guys that may have heard it, but the, bo the same boiling water that hardens an egg softens a potato. And ultimately, it's not about the circumstances, it's about what you're made of. And at the end of the day, I was made of something really special, and that was what God had inside of me. So I knew at that point in time, I can get through anything, and that's where I'm at now. And throughout all that, I'm sitting here now in a position where I just got offered the lead sports anchor job at Fox 5 in Atlanta. Which So to say, to go through all those different obstacles to get to the point where you're still climbing and it's nothing but the grace of God that I was able to get to the point I am now because he set me up and put me in a position where he knew I needed to go through these tough spots, these tough situations to harden that shell that I have to become the man that I am today. And ultimately, that's why my faith is so strong because going through all those things, I knew it was nothing but God. That is awesome. Yeah, I think it's so important for us to remember a lot of times we can be doing everything right and yet we still face obstacles, but I mean, there, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I, I feel, I very firmly believe that God doesn't give us any more than we can handle. Absolutely. Because we're not trying to do it alone. We got to do it with his help. Absolutely. And if we just put everything in his hands, he's definitely going to see us through. So that was a fantastic word. But, you know, this morning, if there's, if there's one final thing that you could share with us, what, what would that be? Yeah, I love to share. I have a poem that I, I sit on my office uh, in my house, and then it's something that I've kind of uh, went back and read throughout my entire career, and it, it just reminds me of a lot of different things. And uh, I wanted to be able to share it with you guys because it meant so much to me. Um, and it goes like this. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. The road to success is not straight. There is a, cur a curve called failure a loop called confusion, speed bump called friends, caution lights called family. You will have flats called jobs, but if you have a space called determination, an engine called perseverance, insurance called faith, a driver called Jesus, you will make it to a place called success. That was great. Do me a favor, give it up one more time for DJ for coming here this morning and sharing with us. Well, I mean, well, well, while they're standing, you want everybody to sing happy birthday to you? That's what I hear. I hear it's your birthday, right? Huh? Yes, huh? it is my huh? birthday. It yeah, is my birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You guys can be seated. Please do not sing. <laughs> All right, but uh, thank you again, DJ, so much for sharing. Uh, we're going to go ahead and pray. Our student pastor is going to come out in just a moment, and uh, he's going to lead us uh, through a time. But let's go ahead and pray, and, and then we'll continue. Uh, dear Lord, we're so grateful, God, just for who you are. Lord, we're so grateful for your faithfulness today, God, Lord, that we can just, uh, Lord, just lean on you, God, in the most difficult circumstances of life, God, Lord. But we ask, Lord, that you would help and just remind us, God, Lord, not just to give you uh, the bad things, God, Lord, just to, but to give you the good things, to put complete control of our lives in your hands, God, where we believe that we can rest in your promises. And we're so thankful for who you are, for what you're doing in our lives, for what you've yet to do in our lives, God. We ask, Lord, you just continue to show us favor, Lord, and we just love you so much. We thank you for who you are. It's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. Amen. One more time for DJ, guys. And uh, Bobby, too, but whatever. Hey, uh, we're going to close out here in just a second. I want to give you an opportunity to respond. You know, anytime the gospel is shared, anytime Jesus is spoken about, you have an opportunity to respond. Uh, DJ, obviously a man of integrity, uh, but a man that is focused on sharing the gospel. You can be a man of integrity uh, and be as lost as the day is long. Um, and the, the difference there is, is Jesus. And so uh, uh, this past week, uh, I was in New Orleans with uh, several of our high school students. We did a mission trip there. 
Um, and we saw two different kind of situations in life. Uh, one, we saw people that I would say were the haves, and then we saw people that were the have-nots. Uh, we were in a park, uh, our, our second day of doing work there, we were in a park, uh, it's the biggest park in North America, bigger than uh, uh, the park in New, New, uh, Central Park in New York, the, the name escaped me for a second, but uh, bigger than Central Park, uh, people everywhere were handing out waters uh, to families and doing just uh, evangelism with families, and uh, you, you, you find a few people that will be willing to listen to you, willing to listen to the gospel, uh, you give them a water, but most people were like, thank you for the water, and then they kind of move on. Uh, then we went to uh, underneath the bridges, literally underneath the bridges in New Orleans where the homeless are. Uh, we're handing out waters. We're handing out um, uh, like fruit and things like that. Uh, and again, you have a few people that are willing to listen to the gospel uh, and then several others that are just sort of rejecting it. You see, we can be successful in life as far as what the world sees, uh, be, be, but be completely lost. We can be desperate, physically desperate as the world sees, uh, but be completely lost. Uh, and the difference is Jesus. And I started thinking about uh, just a few people that we, we interacted with while we were there. One guy who was uh, literally um, close to death that was, was homeless. I mean, he was, he was very much close to death. Uh, couldn't really speak to us very well, uh, but we shared the gospel with him. And uh, as we were leaving, you know, some of our students were, were kind of down, were kind of disappointed and thinking that, you know, did we really make an impact? And it kind of took me back um, to what we read in Romans. It's Romans chapter 10, uh, verses 9 and 10. This is what it says, that if we confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And the verse 10 that we don't always read, uh, for, it, it, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth mouth that you confess and are saved. You see, uh, we, we like to, to make the gospel like a complicated thing sometimes. We like to say that it's Jesus and something else. Uh, the gospel is just Jesus and what he did for us. You know, we think about uh, the account of Jesus on the cross. Uh, he is uh, uh, has two criminals beside him, one that rejects him and one that accepts him. The one that accepted him did not get an opportunity to get off of the cross and go do a bunch of good things. All it was was for him to believe in his heart and confess who Jesus was and say, Jesus, remember me. Uh, and Jesus said to him and promised him that he would be with him uh, in paradise. You see, that's what salvation is. Salvation is a heart change, a belief in your heart and a confession of your mouth. And so maybe you're here this morning uh, and, and that's where you find yourself spiritually. Maybe you've got everything going on for you that this world would say is success, uh, but in your heart you know that you're far away from God and you need a relationship with him through Jesus. It all, all it takes is for you to believe that in your heart and confess that with your mouth. That's what salvation is. So we're going to give you an opportunity to respond this morning, respond to the gospel, uh, and respond to Jesus. So with every uh, eye closed, with every head bowed, we're going to leave you in a, in, a, in a prayer this morning. Father, we love you. God, we thank you for your free gift in Jesus. And God, there's, there's not many things in this life that are truly free. But God, you've given us Jesus a free gift of salvation, God. None of us can earn our way to salvation. None of us can do good enough things to get us there. God, the gospel is not Jesus and a bunch of good things. It's not Jesus and us trying to get to you. But God, it is Jesus and only Jesus who came and died for our sins, who came as the, the, the sacrifice that we needed to pay for sin. And God, if, if we just sin one time, then God, we've, we've done enough to be separated from you. But God, because of your great love and because of your mercy, you sent Jesus as an atonement of sin. So God, I pray that there's anybody here this morning that is far away from you, anybody that, that knows that they've never believed in their heart and confessed with their mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. God, that they are lost and this morning they need salvation. God, as your word says, that today is the day of salvation. And so, God, if that's them this morning, I pray they would just pray a simple prayer of, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I believe you are who you say you are, that you are the Messiah, that you are our Savior. And, Jesus, I confess that with my mouth, that you are Lord. God, if there's anybody here this morning that has done that, I pray that they would just lift their hand and look at me. 
Now, if there's anybody here this morning, thank you, sir, I see you. If there's anybody else that has done that this morning. Well, listen, whether I see you or not, God sees you. God sees your heart this morning. God knows where you are spiritually. And God loves you so much that he sent Jesus. In a few minutes, we're going to have some altar counselors come up. They want to come up and just pray with you, uh, encourage you, and take you down to the next step. Uh, As you look at the screen, too, this morning, there's going to be a a number that pops up. Uh, You'll just text TRUST to that number. If you're watching online, that will happen for you. Uh, And it's very simple. That's not for us to, to hound you and to bother you and to show up at your door. That's for us to rejoice with you and encourage you in the days ahead. But, God, as we're here today, Father, We just thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your free gift of salvation. God, we love you. And we can love you, God, because of Jesus. And we ask all that in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, we are obviously in a time of transition. And as I said in the first service, uh, it's a tough transition, but it's a good transition because we know the Lord's in it. And so this morning, uh, Josh Gibbs is going to be coming, uh, representing the nominating team. Josh, thanks, ma'am. Thanks, Corey. Um, What a great word from DJ. Um, Very motivating uh, to see somebody who's um, out there in a world that uh, is attacking us Christians left and right, and he's standing up for Jesus. Um, So as Corey said, um, I'm representing the nominating committee. Um, It's chosen by the church every year to make recommendations um, on who should serve on the various committees as members rotate off. If you were here last week, a little bit of this is going to be a repeat, and then I kind of have a challenge for you guys. Um, A few weeks back, our committee met and formed a solid pastor search team from a list of uh, Liberty Church members um, who've been faithfully serving in the church for years. Um, Three of the five of these members were on the team that brought us uh, Pastor Chris, so we're we're very encouraged uh, that we have a really good group. Um, So... Going forward, um, this month they're going to go through some initial training period and then they'll begin the process of prayerfully and carefully selecting a candidate that the church is later going to vote on as our new senior pastor uh, for Liberty. Um, Those members are Clay Hall, who's going to chair the committee, um, Kim Garrett, Reagan Green, Rhonda Dixon, Chan Flanders, and then Delisha Jett and Sean Wooten will uh, both serve as alternates in case they need somebody to fill in. Um, This is a huge responsibility for these guys, Um, and they were all, you know, willing to serve, um, but we need to be lifting them up in prayer and encouraging them. Um, I mean, I look at all the faces here, and I see um, just so many lives that have been changed, so many families that have been changed in this church, and we want to keep doing that. We want to keep moving forward and uh, doing what Liberty does best, and that's uh, shining the light of Jesus uh, across the street and around the world. So um, as I lift up these people in prayer, I want you guys to remember them during the week. Keep praying for them and um, just keep encouraging them and, and, and be, be excited, guys. Just because one chapter is closed with Chris leaving um, does not mean that the, the, this is the end. It's just the, the beginning of a new chapter that we're going to face, and I'm excited to see the work that God's going to do here at Liberty. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord. Thank you for these members, God, that uh, have stepped up and uh, are going to do your work, Lord. I just pray that you keep their hearts sensitive uh, to the Holy Spirit as he leads them into choosing our new pastor. God, I pray that uh, you be with their spouses and their families. Um, God, just just give them all the support that they need and the wisdom and the the courage, God, to to step out in faith and to trust you that you have a, a leader out there for us. You know who it is, God, but I want you to make it perfectly clear to them and then and then to this church, God, as we as we decide on our our next pastor. God, I lift up Chris and Amy to you. Um, He was so faithful, did so much for this church, poured out his life in this church. And I pray that you continue to bless his ministry um, as he moves on to the next phase of his life. God, I ask you um, to be with Bob Record as he's going to serve as our interim interim pastor. God, I'm so thankful uh, that we have such a godly man, such a great communicator to lead us through this time. Um, And Lord, be with our future pastor. You know who it is. 
God, I just pray that you go ahead and work ahead of schedule in his heart. That, uh, God, that he feels the need and the desire to, to move towards us. And as we reach out to him, help him be receptive. And uh, I guess most importantly, importantly God, I, I pray for all these members here. Um, Lord, if I was the enemy, this is when I would start my attack. This is when I would tear up families. Um, I would I would have uh, caused problems in people's work, their finances, whatever. God, I just pray that, that we stay unified, God, that, um, that we keep trusting you, and that, God, if there's any spirit of fear, um, division, negativity, God, that you'll just remove that because we know that, God, you didn't give us a spirit of fear. You gave us one of power and love and self-control. I just pray that for every member of this church and that we continue to be faithful, come, serve you, worship you, and, and do what we do in liberty, God. And I pray that uh, you just keep us focused on our purpose, Lord, and that's, again, um, taking the gospel to, the neighbor, to our neighbors and to the nations. We ask you um, all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stay tuned. Uh, the next couple of weeks, you're going to hear a little more about how God has somehow miraculously made us completely debt-free and with a tremendous amount of money to uh, move forward and renovate the new um, worship center. So uh, you're going to be hearing about that, about that the next couple of weeks. So uh, just come back to Liberty. You're dismissed.